Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? My name is Tarek. I'm working with Bernard, and uh, we are organizing a lot of these things. And this is uh, a, one of the featured events for the future of learning, which we are uh, developing together. And uh, uh, grateful to Fiona to, to join us today to bring all of you. And my role today is to be uh, to really to take you on a journey into the future, uh, into the year 2030. And then we'll bring our special guest for today. His name is Paul Sloan. Uh, Paul's come all the way from, from England, and he's here on a short trip. He's a, an expert in innovation, and he's going to talk to us all things innovation and how innovation can be integrated into learning, into how you, you know, engage within schools and what happens in business when a lot of people come out. This is the very near future. This is actually happening as we speak right now. We walk into companies where we are seeing robots and artificial intelligence uh, just sitting there within boardrooms. I dare say some of the teachers here are going to be robots very, very soon. So <laughs> this is going to be in your principal's office. Uh, and I think the best teachers of the future, and this is, I'm, I'm throwing the grenade right up front, the best teachers of the future are going to be the teacher with a robot next to them because that's where a lot of the knowledge is going to be and the teacher will have a lot of the wisdom. And then together and the empathy and the love and the connection and so on because the robot won't have that. So the future is, the future ladders are like this because these ladders are broken. They are non-symmetrical. And, and I think that is the kind of thinking when you're teaching and when, when the learning uh, elements are there is you need to think through that kind of process. A lot of people don't think about this as urbanization. The world will have about three to 400 cities, about 400 cities maximum, which will represent 70% plus of the GDP of the countries and of the world. Literally, 400 cities. 100 of those cities you and I can recognize, London, Paris, Frankfurt, uh, Berlin. But the next 100, very few of us will recognize. And the last 200, none of us will even know. So how many people can name the eighth largest city in China, or the fifth largest city in Chile, or the fourth largest city in Nigeria? That's the kind of question we will be asking ourselves. With each one of these cities, will be 10 million plus cities. So the urbanization is going to be a new shift for all sorts of opportunities in schools, for hotels, for hospitality, all hospitals, because urbanization will be one of the key factors. Uh, there's a lot we need to be looking at in terms of fear and in terms of because uh, there's a lot going on in the world today in terms of the social aspects and the wellness aspects. This is another area of huge things, climate change and stuff, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, aging. Aging in about 10 years time will be considered a disease because oh, you haven't been taking the medicines, you haven't been taking the genetics because why are you aging? Why, why is your hair grey? Why have you lost your hair? Aging will become a disease uh, you will, there's a company called Longevity Inc, uh, which is working against, or towards ending death. You don't need to die. You can technically live forever. Uh, there's another concept of retiring retirement. Retirement was very much a 20, 20th century, 19th century concept, where you were living in the Industrial Revolution. Now in a digital world, where your life spans 150, 200 years, why would you retire at the age of 65, 70? This is a, a key chart where most companies, most businesses are on the red line. However, the yellow lines are at the, at the bottom are the, the new industries that are coming up. What are these new industries? So how long do you think 3D printing has been around? Give me a guess. Five years. Five years. Anybody else? How long do you think genome sequencing has been around? 3D printing has been around for over 35 years, and the same with genome uh, sequencing. So it grows incrementally, incrementally, very, and then suddenly it takes over, and then it accelerates. So the moment it gets to one, then it just completely takes off. So a lot of these industries are in stealth mode. So we don't see them. We feel really, really safe. And suddenly they hit you. It's game over. Final comment that anything that can be digitized will be, because it will be a thousand times more uh, efficient and a thousand times cheaper than human beings. But anything that cannot be digitized, love, empathy, intuition, relationships, connections, relevant, will be a million times more valuable. And 
That is where we invest our time. That is where we invest our money. And that's where we develop our young children. And you are educators and you would develop this. So it's about the soft stuff that needs to grow. Google has eight competencies that they, they work on in terms of performance measurement and so on. STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Maths, is number eight. The first seven are all to do with connection, team building, work collaboration, and problem solving, nothing to do with basic science and technology. So while STEM is really important, I think our softer skills is our future. Thank you. Thank you. Man, fall over. Good evening. And uh, thank you, Tarek, for that introduction. And a marvelous review of technology and, and the scary aspects of technology. And um, I'm not going to go into that. You did mention politics a little bit about Trump and Brexit. And um, the teacher said to the class, she said, uh, tomorrow, children, we're going to talk about politics. I want you to go home and ask your parents about politics and see if you can find out what it's all about. And little Johnny went home and he went to his mother and he said, Mummy said, what's politics? And she said, oh, it's very complex. Ask your father when he gets home. So he waited and his father came home and he said, Daddy, he said, he said, what's politics? And his father said, how can I explain this to your son? And he said, well, um, I go out and work and I earn a lot of money to pay for everything here in the house. So I'm like capitalism. Okay. And Johnny said, yes. And he said, and your mother, she looks after everything. She takes care of everything. I organize the whole household. She's like the government. He said, all right. And he said, well, what am I? He said, well, you're like the people, citizenship. You, you, we look after you. So you're like the people. And he said, you need and, and the little child said, well, what about my younger brother, baby brother? And his father said, well, he represents the future. All right. And he said, well, what about the au pair? Well, as father said, the au pair, she does the washing and she does the cooking and she looks after. She's like the working class. All right? so she does all the work. He says, have you got that? So he says, yeah. And he's thinking about it. He's thinking very seriously about this. Anyway, in the middle of the night, he wakes up and hears his little baby brother crying. And he goes in to see his baby brother. And the baby brother is crying and he's, he's sore, his nappy, and it's, it's just horrible, terror. Oh, it's just awful. So he goes to wake up the au pair to... to and he's horrified to find that she's in bed with his father. <laughs> so he goes to wake his mother, and his mother's snoring away. He can't wake her. So he goes back to bed. The next day he goes into school. And the teacher said, can anybody here tell me what politics is all about? And Johnny raised his hand. He says, yes. She says, well, what's politics all about, Johnny? He said, well, it's like this, Miss. While capitalism is screwing the working class, the government is asleep. The people are being ignored, and the future's in deep, deep doodah. <laughs> and that's how kids learn. Um, so I help organisations improve innovation. I speak and write and uh, blog a lot on lateral thinking, which is my field, and how to use that in creativity and innovation in business primarily. But I'm also a STEM ambassador. Uh, I've got an en uh, engineering background. I worked in software for a long time. And I go into schools and I speak in schools a lot. And I'd like to share with you some of the things I talk about and some of the concepts and some of the challenges. Um, because the children that you're educating now, the children that you have, the children in your schools, they'll enter the workforce in their early 20s. And they'll probably work until at least they're 70, maybe beyond, at least 50 years. And what jobs will they be doing in 20, 30, 40 years' time? What skills will they particularly need, technical skills, in those times? The answer is, nobody knows. The smartest people on the planet don't know what jobs people will be doing in 20, 30 years' time and what particular skills they'll need. Um, and it's kind of scary. And you've got to prepare kids for this environment. Things are really rocketing along at the moment with artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, big data and cloud computing and, and brain-computer interface and all these things. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, and what does that mean for the kids at school today? I think it means fantastic opportunity. And what I say to children is, you've never had a better opportunity to have a really interesting life, a fulfilling career, doing different interesting things, all sorts of uh, different things through your life, uh, to earn a lot of money and to have a lot of satisfaction. Um, and there's going to be some fantastic opportunities, but there's also going to be some real crap jobs around that are left. And, and it's up to you 
in, in which category you're going to fall. And one of the things you have to do with your children is build their self-esteem, build their belief that they're capable of something special. And everyone, most people think they're capable of something special. They can make a difference in the world. They can make a positive difference. Um, but some people, their self-esteem drops. I think a lot of girls, their self-esteem drops when they be, become teenagers and they become very self-aware and self-conscious and, and worried about their appearance and things. And, and it, it, successful people know they're capable of something special and because of that, they set themselves high standards. They're not satisfied with what they've achieved. They want to do better because they know they're good. And the difference between the ones who are successful and the ones who are failures, if you can call them failures, is the choices that you make. The decisions that you make are what determines whether you're successful or not in life, whether you have a good life or a crappy life. If you have a crappy life, it's your fault because you've had lots of opportunity. It's not as though you're born in Ethiopia and in a starving village, you've got a lot of opportunity and it, it, it's up to you to make the most of that opportunity. So, and I contrast successful people with victims. And you've all met victims, people who say, it's not my, my parents never believed in me. I never got the right opportunities. I was unlucky. Teachers didn't really push me. They should have. And they blame other people. And, and what I say is successful people don't blame other people. They, they take responsibility. And kids have to learn very early to take responsibility for themselves and their own success. And you can help with this. Um, and private schools generally are good at this, at building self-esteem and building communication skills. So although technology is crucial, and we can talk about coding, and we can talk about Python, and we can talk about Raspberry Pi and all this. I spent Christmas Day assembling the Raspberry Pi for my grandson. And th these are all important things, and STEM is very important. But in the future, you're still going to have to manage people, and you're going to have to understand people, and you have to communicate with people. And the ability to communicate cogently, clearly, concisely is a critical skill for anyone who wants to be a leader, anyone who wants to get their ideas across. Spoke, spoken ideas, written ideas, presenting ideas. And that's something that you're typically are good at, I would think. Something you don't teach them at school, which is really important, is networking. There's an old saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And the, so the kids today will do that. As they go through life, the kids they knew at school, the ones they keep in touch with at university and all the way through, it's very important for them to learn networking skills. And it's not a question of exploiting people, it's a question of mutual advantage. What can I do for you and what can you do for me? We can help each other. And it's who you know, because it's the people you know who know the opportunities. It's this concept, there's an answer. And there's multiple answers. And I have a lot of fun with kids on this. What is it that a dog does that a man steps into? What is it that a dog does and a man steps into? And once you've thought of the answer you've thought of, it's really hard to think of the, another answer. And the answer is pants. I was promised a live audience. <laughs> <laughs> A dog pants and a man steps into pants, all right? But once you've thought, the, once you've thought in that groove, it's really hard to get yourself out of that, isn't it? And, and uh, we, we tend to do that. We, we go straight for the first answer. And your, one of your tasks, I think, is to equip kids to look creatively at every problem and to say there's multiple ways. And many ways in mathematics, there's, I wrote a book of mathematical lateral thinking puzzles with a co-author, a very clever guy. And it's all about elegant ways to solve problems. And I think you've got to get the kids thinking about that, whether it's a hairdresser or a restaurant or a, um, a, a, a video game, they can do it. Uh, and to do that, they need a mix of skills. And, and some of these, and, and a lot of schools to have uh, entrepreneurial uh, activities and um, things where they start little businesses. And kids go for it really, really well. So those are some of the ideas I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Let's uh, ask, open it up to some uh, Q&A. Uh, I uh, provoked and challenged a few people in terms of the future. Uh, Paul uh, shared some of his insights. Not just skills in general, but lots of, uh, you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, right? Yeah. And actually how it's, it's basically it's a game changer in terms of the way in which we're thinking and working. Why, I work in the advertising agency world, and the integrated model is very archaic, it's still Mad Men days, everyone's split into their own disciplines, there's no agility, but we're trying to change that. Why are schools around the world still stuck in a Victorian model, when we are 24-7, 365, always open? How do we change that? What do we do? Is it, is it parents that demand it? Is it, is it the teachers or the, 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 the people, the 
innovators that say no things have to change because of our world. But how do you change that? How do you change that nine till three in the UK system, for example? Do you mean schools evolving as the world evolves? Mark, you work shift patterns, you do different things, you learn different things, but the fact of it is is that it's a 24-7, 365, always on world. And Nobody knows what the ideal thing to teach children is, but they, I mean, I learned Fortran at university. I've never used Fortran, but the fact I learned how to do some coding was useful. Uh, and, and most of the stuff, it's funny, most of the stuff I learned at university I don't use. I did an engineering degree at Cambridge. I don't use any of that. Things I learned at school I use. The fact I know where an apostrophe goes and shouldn't go is something I learned at grammar school. And people that can't put an apostrophe in the right place really annoy me. And, yeah, so, and it's terrible. I'm a pedant. All right, all right. But um, people that can't spell and can't express themselves. So the basic skills that you're giving them are essential life skills. All right? And the other things they layer on top. And then they'll replace them. And the fact that I learned finite elements and all stuff is irrelevant because I don't use it anymore. All right? But the fact that I, I was able to learn that was because of the foundation that, you, that my teachers gave me. So uh, it, it, it's very hard to give them the skills that they're going to need exactly in 20 years' time. Give them the basics, but give them self-belief, give them confidence, give them the ability to think clearly and argue both sides of the case. Give them the ability to distinguish fake news from real news. Give them the ability to recognise a scam on the internet and, and, and to be aware of, of, of the world and its opportunities and its threats. Well, I also sort of challenge the concept of Victorian schooling because when I went to school, and I went to a convent boarding school, and I was really privileged, I had great education. Um, but if, 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 if Sister Vianney said that that was a really nice pink wall, I would have said, yes, Sister, and which shade of pink would you like that to be? Um, whereas now, we have discussions with kids, and we say, that's a pink wall, and they go, no, miss, that's silly, it's, it's not pink, it's silver. So the discussion is very different with children yeah. today. There's a respect that flows both ways that was very hierarchical when I was at school. You did as you were told. You sat in the chair, you listened, you didn't argue back. And when you did, you got into trouble like I always did. Um, so I think that is different. But what's fabulous picking up from the two of you, and we, we discussed it at Governors um, last week, but I, we haven't put it out to parents yet, is that, and I've, I've got a copy of it here, is we've, we've rethought what we think are the most important things for your children to learn. Um, and whilst the math and the English are incredibly important, because we, I agree the GCSEs and the A-levels will get them through the hoop, we've identified that we've got six values that we want our children to focus on from the school. Um, and they're simple. They're integrity, honesty, compassion, kindness, respect, and courage. But more importantly, what we've done is we've come up with a set of attributes and it's the attributes that we think are the key things that are going to help children be successful. And they're about developing a different type of skill set. The knowledge piece, or, or the, the education piece, is a given. That's what great schools do. Great schools all around the world, regardless of what type they are. But we want to focus on leadership, commitment, problem solving, creativity, decision making, collaboration, adaptability, resilience, risk taking, and responsibility. And what we've then created, believe it or not, is what the only heading I could come up with when I was thinking about it was a title called The State of Being. Um, because ultimately, what we want to create are states of happiness, optimism, curiosity, purpose, all underpinned with wisdom, yes. So, that, so the education piece is fundamental to what we do. Um, but I also think that we're privileged as educators that I'm far more adaptable and far more knowledgeable, I think, and diverse than my two younger sisters are, who are both as educated as I am, but because I'm involved in education and because I'm working with young people, I have to keep, try and at least keep up to speed with them the whole time. So technologically, it's a good place to be. Um, and, and our jobs are one of the safe ones, which is also really good. So that, that's a good place to be. Sorry for that. No, 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 please stay. No, no, Fiona, Fiona, please stay. We are measuring on the two intelligence, the uh, uh, verbal and numerical. And that's how SAT is done. That's how a lot of our work is done. But there are eight or 10 other intelligences around us. What are they? Spiritual intelligence, spatial intelligence, social intelligence, sensual intelligence. All of these new intelligences are the soft things that I'm, I'm talking about. Is that we as, as young people and older people need to develop those multiple intelligences as opposed to just being focused on the stuff that gets us through and has got us through in the past. 
And, and so the, the future SAT exams shouldn't be verbal and numerical, should be all of the other elements too. My personal sense of things is that listening to um, your deliveries is that some things are going to change and some things are not going to change. Yes. And I think it's the equilibrium between those two for me that's most fundamental. What I'm curious to know from you is what you think is not going to change. In other words, what fundamentals are going to stay consistent um, in terms of schooling? It's a great scene in um, Carry On Headmaster or something where Frankie Howard goes to to see the head and uh, the head, and he says, what do you teach here at this school? It's a trillion to, and, the and the head says, we teach the three R's. And, and Craigie Howard says, oh, I've always thought it's good to have your R's to fall back on. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's a lot from, and, and it's a terrible joke, but the three R's, and people are still going to be reading, writing, and using arithmetic. I mean, there's been a big debate about whether kids should learn the tables uh, in the UK. And, and some people said, I don't use my tables. And, don't need them but it seems to me essential and when I was interviewing people for uh, admin positions I used to say to them what's 60 percent of 40 and a lot of them struggle with school leavers they couldn't do it and I said how can you then offer a discount to our distributors and know what if the invoice is right and she said well I'll check it on the calculator but you should know you should know what 60 percent of 40 is and and so, so I think those basic skills are going to be in demand forever and I think the ability to express yourself clearly People think you know text language is going to take over. See you later and all this sort of. Thing. But I don't think so. I think I think the ability to express yourself clearly in written form and verbally, uh, and the ability to to uh, uh, master basic mathematics uh, is fundamental. Uh, so those things and reading is is really important. The kids that can read early have an enormous advantage over the kids who struggle to read. As you know, I'm telling you stuff you already know, but. Uh, Getting kids reading and in the habit of reading and, and liking books is, is essential. And they're going to read reports in, you know, in 50 years' time. And they're going to have to be able to express complex choices and they're going to have to present them. Uh, so those skills, the, the analysis, the creative problem solving, all of that stuff, whether they do enough history or whether they do enough geography or whether they should do Latin or, or Turkish, I don't know, they, they, you can debate all of those things. But, um, there's a lot of evidence that learning a second language is, is, is very good for the brain. And that the, the people that speak two languages fluently are less likely to get Alzheimer's, I've, I've read somewhere. Yeah, and so, uh, music. And, and music, music, oh yeah. yeah. So you <laughs> bring music into that. Yeah, well, the like, other one is curiosity. Yeah. I, I think one of the key things when I, when I talk about the future is, is we need to remain curious. Uh, constantly find ways to, to not become jaded. Um, constantly find ways to be curious, constantly ask a fresh set of questions. Because as we are, we get, get a plethora of uh, technology coming in, we are the ones who need to ask questions. The machines will just give us, compute the answers for us. But we need to ask those for them. And kids do. Children, children do. Children do. And then, and over time, they, they get leveled out in terms of their curiosity because they are normed and formed and packaged and processed and sausaged. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, what you were saying. One of the things we were talking about last week as a leadership team, and we were having a conversation about, um, about these values and what it means to have that in an education system. And we can't, I, I always tell parents when they're new, when they come into the school, that, that my job isn't actually to get their kids through exams and at the other end of it. I, I come to believe that my job is to, to turn out great adults it's to make sure that there are great 25-year-old, 35, 45-year-olds who can ask the right questions and make the right decisions. Um, and actually, I think I was probably more resilient as a teenager than many teenagers are today because I, I didn't have maybe the, the luxury of some of the padding around me that exists in today's society. So you, you fell down, you got up, you got hurt, and you got on with it, and, and you worked your way through it. Today, our children fall down, and we go, oh my gosh, are you okay? Um, so it is slightly different, and I think that parents need to rethink some of the, the approach to, to nurture nature that, that exists. But we came up with the conclusion that our job is actually to build character. Schools are about building character. Uh, the education piece is fundamental, of course, we'll go back to that. I just want to reassure you we are doing the reading, the writing, the math. <laughs> <laughs> in case you think we're leaving all of that out, we're not. But it is about building character. It's about trying to turn out good people. 
um, because good people, a recent study that we were talking about yesterday, we did a wellness session with staff, uh, well-being, and we're meant to be in bed by, what time is it tonight, Jana? Seven o'clock, is it? I need seven hours. Yeah, we need seven hours. <laughs> and, and I need some play time. We need play time, we need all of these wrong. things. But they were talking about this hard, piece of Harvard research um, for seven, uh, the 75 years in the making. Um, about you know the, the characteristics happiness. of the happiness, and, and the word that they came up with, the, the one thing that people said determined their success, was love. Is a quality of relationships. Yes. Love yes. was yes. actually the only thing that makes you happy. Yes. Everything else is. Yes. And, and that's a 75 year old, 75 years in the making study. study is yeah. still happening, and and the one conclusion time and time again is about relationships relationships and love. It's not about, of course the money you make in there and the job and the car, and of course they, they make a huge difference in terms of the happiness factor, but at the end of it, it was about relationships and it was about love. So that's what we're trying to build. It sounds a bit soft, but that's what we're trying to build. I mean, I guess everything is getting very soft and fluffy. <laughs> you know, t tonight's opportunity was about provoking discussion. Um, we're, we're in the the infancy of creating a room on the second floor that originally we were going to call a critical thinking room, that we're now going to call an open thinking room. Um, and that came from the conversations that we had. Um, that maybe it is just about creating opportunities for our children to, to discuss things in a different way, to think differently. Um, certainly for me, the journey at Heartland and, and moving in that direction has, has changed me in terms of my thinking. And I certainly think about education in a different way. And that's entirely driven by being surrounded by three, four-year-olds every day, believe it or not. It's completely changed my outlook as opposed to being surrounded my whole life by 11 to 18-year-olds. Um, um, so we just need to make sure that we capture the essence of what's incredibly magical about children, about their creativity and their imaginations, and not put the constraints on it that education can do, and somehow just give them those skills um, for the future that will help them pay for our pensions at some point in life. Um, but more importantly, that will just create something for them um, that will give them that drive, the ambition, the resilience, the creativity, the vision to create something that is beyond perhaps what we have today. So it's about their hopes and dreams, not about us living our hopes and dreams through them. Um, it's about who they are and who they become. So just. Uh, on behalf of all of us, to the two of you, thank you. Thank you.